In the autumn of 2022, Culturopolis, a conference co-organized by the Culture Institute of Barcelona and Culture Action Europe, brought together researchers, cultural workers, artists and policymakers to exchange ideas and work around cultural rights. Participants from near and far gathered to discuss access, cultural practices, innovation and many more other topics. I'm Maya Weisinger from Culture Action Europe. And I'm Marco Fiore from Michael Culture. Welcome to our four-part series that explores the current discourse and practice around cultural rights in our communities across Europe. Today's episode focuses on digital environments. What is the relationship between cultural rights and digital rights? How can digitalizing culture, on the one hand, create new possibilities for access and participation, but on the other, create new inequalities? Join us as we dive deeper into conversations around our digital reality and what it means for the future of the cultural sector. As a cultural enthusiast, I have seen firsthand how digitalization is transforming the way we experience art and culture. From virtual exhibitions to live stream performances, the digital world has opened up a whole new range of opportunities for artists and audiences alike. I have been lucky enough to attend virtual museum exhibitions from the comfort of my own home, explore interactive installations, and witness the creation of AI-generated art. While the experience is different from physically being in a space, it offers a new level of accessibility and convenience that I find truly exciting. As digitalization continues to shape the cultural sector, I'm eager to see what new possibilities and innovations will emerge and how they will impact our relationship with art and culture. Now, all of what I have just said was not in fact written by me. It was written by ChatGPT, an artificial intelligence chatbot developed by OpenAI and launched in November of 2022. And while, sure, it's not the most exciting bit of text, it is an interesting glimpse into our current digital reality. Playing with this chatbot, I've prompted it to write songs, create a fiction, even scripts. It feels like an exciting little game. But outside of my fun, how do things like AI-generated art impact the cultural sector? How does digitalization impact the rights and working conditions for artists and cultural workers? And what does it mean for the way we all consume and access art and culture? I'm new to the topic, or so I keep telling myself, but the conversations we had in Barcelona opened my eyes to seeing the ways in which our digital environment has already been growing all around us. I have an appointment with Tjeke Janssen, a postdoctoral researcher at the Data Justice Lab. It's almost night, and outside the theatre, light is becoming weaker and weaker. Her research looks at how datification is changing the power relationships in society, with a particular focus on the use of data systems by public institutions. During my conversation with her, we got the chance to talk a bit about data spaces and how they relate to cultural rights. Data spaces are at the heart of the digital decade, the new digital strategy by the EU. The objective is to have digital environments where data can be securely stored, shared and accessed by various actors. I have a very specific reason to talk with Fieke. MCA is part of the consortium that will build the data space for cultural heritage. New roads are going to be explored. But I want to go deeper and learn why, in Fieke's opinion, this whole movement started. Well, I think we first have to unpack what, unpack what the motivation of the European Commission is to create these data spaces. Uh, because if you look at their white paper on AI, they have a very clear analysis that they're losing the race on sort of uh, the digitization of society to the US and, and China. So they did an analysis and they said, most of our sort of consumer data is hosted by um, American cloud services. We had to have very little control over what happens there. But more problematic is that we're actually not able as European companies to build products on top of these data spaces because we don't have access to them. So it's a very market driven approach on why we need to localize or nationalize or Europeanize these data spaces um, or create data spaces so that we're able to create market products out of them. 
practice. So I think this is quite important to keep in mind when we see these policies and these investments within data spaces or within sort of the new technologies. It's sort of driven from a market logic. But of course, it's not just a business-driven approach. These kinds of structures can have a large impact on society. How can these data spaces support stronger cultural rights? That doesn't mean that these data spaces do not have value for other types of things like cultural um, uh, cultural rights, for example. But actually, if we look at these uh, European data spaces that they're creating, and I'm not sure which data spaces they're creating at uh, all of them which are creating but what we see is a lot of sort of um, business to business markets so can we uh, do smart cities implementations can we store other data that's not consumer data but more industry data data and you can wonder to what extent that actually transfers into cultural rights whereas you can also think can we create maybe a data space for cultural rights so but I think that will require quite some lobbying work uh, to get that included in there and financial capital invested in it, rather than creating a data space in which sort of cultural rights uh, can flourish, I think maybe first we want to think about how do we want cultural rights, cultural heritage to flourish on the internet? What do we actually want from it? What is our strategy on a, lo on a municipal level, on a public institution level, on a national level, on a European level? Um, and, and sort of what are we driving towards because I feel like we're missing that dot on the horizon and, uh, and I think it's also because we get distracted by the technology and the data because I think if we look at a lot of these cultural policies the answers are already included in it. It's like uh, we want diversity, we want openness, we want access, it has educational purposes, all of these things and this should also be part of sort of these data spaces that are then created for cultural rights. At the same time, my question is, what are some of the challenges we face in pushing for culture within data spaces? Data spaces also don't come for free, so you have to invest money in it. So there will be a political motivation in why to create certain data spaces and not other data spaces, because you have to not only create it, but maintain it, update it, uh, keep it. I would fear that if we push to create a cultural uh, data space that in the end it would be like a very small niche group of people defining what this data space should be and and we probably take into account some of the more traditional cultural heritage sites or, or cultural spaces but maybe we lose out on all of the newer like remix culture or uh, sort of uh, youth culture or other types of culture that are not uh, considered either culture or that are uh, not being represented in these European spaces so I think here, the, I think the risk is really about sort of uh, if it's a top, because the risk, of course, that we create a top-down data space where we define the parameters of what it looks like and uh, from Brussels or from a national government and then uh, sort of implement it downwards, which will mean that it might not fit the needs of either cultural institutions or other types of cultures that are not represented uh, in these debates. Fieke references the European White Paper on AI which outlines the European Commission's strategy for promoting the development and use of artificial intelligence, while also ensuring that it is used in a safe and ethical manner. The paper emphasizes the need for a human-centric approach to AI, with a focus on transparency, accountability and respect for fundamental rights. Fieke says that the areas of industry and human rights dominate in the discourse when discussing the place and future of AI in Europe but stresses the importance of expanding the conversation. What is missing are like social, cultural, economic rights. So these were hardly taken into account in the critiques of the, um, the White Paper on AI or the European AI Act, which means actually that a lot of these more broader concerns or learnings or sort of uh, our, our social cultural rights are actually not taken into account when we're shaping the digital agenda of Europe that will then indeed will impact everybody from remix culture to uh, a museum to sort of uh, education um, and I think here so what I mean here is that cultural institutions also have a role to play that sort of uh, Maybe we need to step down into their com step to their conversations, but they also have to become an active part of these conversations because it will shape their future. Uh, it will also shape the future of cinema and uh, spaces like this. 
And the idea of cultural institutions at the center of the conversation is what, for example, we try to convey at NCA. In the framework of the data space, Michael Culture will be an aggregator for the museums. Perhaps Fieke has some suggestions on it. How do we move forward to be able to see this deeper engagement in and around culture in European data spaces and the digital domain in general? Actually, when we look at uh, where the internet and where newer technologies came from, actually a lot of sort of the ground investments were made by uh, state funding. So whether that's through uh, DARPA, which is the uh, um, military funding of the US, or whether it's through Horizon 2020 or Horizon Europe, this is the new uh, age we're in, uh, a lot of actually these more experimental technologies first got paid for uh, by the state or... Um, uh, the, or the seed capital, what uh, Masukatu says, actually comes from state financing. And um, maybe they should do something similar like this, but for the cultural sector, have sort of this experimental funding mm. for broadening this idea about um, uh, what it is, what culture means, what diversity means, how can we translate this to an online environment, what is needed for this. Um, and I don't think that's happening at the moment. Digitalization has significantly impacted the lives of artists at the community level, enabling them to connect with each other and with audiences in new and innovative ways. Through digital platforms and tools, artists can share their work and collaborate with others from around the world, breaking down geographical barriers and expanding the reach of their creative output. Digitalization has also enabled artists to build and engage with online communities, Social media platforms and other online channels provide a way for artists to showcase their work and connect with audiences on a more personal level. This has opened up new opportunities for artists to connect with like-minded individuals, share their experiences, and build a sense of community around their work. And that was yet another AI-generated quote for you. But the bot does pinpoint something important the ways in which creating and sharing work has become more accessible for artists, especially ones from marginalized communities. Enter the project La Fera, a Barcelona-based group that launches Catalan language projects in the digital universe of platforms, giving them resources that enable them to grow, reach new audiences, and make them sustainable and self-sufficient. La Fera is harnessing the power of new technologies to empower communities. Never ever in history it was so easy for a minority or medium language to publish, to getting hurt. Um, it's the barrier of entry right now is zero. Distribution is basically free. You can post your video in any social media for free. It will be distributed across the world for free and they will uh, put subtitles on it for free. So. You can speak in your language from your community in a meaningful and authentic way to the world for free. And that's amazing. The, the digital sphere uh, seems like a danger for like small and medium languages. But as uh, we think and we, we try to, to convince people, it's also like a big opportunity for them to, to grow or at least not to decrease or to lose their energy and their uh, interest. Uh, not as a nostalgic thing of the past, but as like alive languages that are useful in nowadays. Albert and Xavier are the founders of La Fera. We meet right inside the conference venue and we decide to grab a beer. Maybe choosing a very busy street has not been a great idea. I realized this right in the middle of the conversation. I already know what I want to talk with them about. Technology is such an important tool that so many creators may already have access to already. But do artists and creators have the right skill sets to take advantage of these tools? Xavier goes into how La Fera is bridging the gap. We have a lot of partners, uh, audio experts, video experts, designers, creators. And we have some sessions. Uh, we have a program called Programa Embryo, which is the Embryo program, to do exactly that. Um, uh, we have uh, some sessions to, for example, to talk about how to produce your content in a pro way, how to design your channel to be visible and relevant, how to build a story, 
everything you say, everything you try to communicate has to follow a story pattern. What's the problem? Uh, this is the solution. How you get to that solution? Of course, every every streamer knows how to use OBS. I mean, but they don't know how to use OBS. They they don't know how to really use that tool. They they don't know how to make it because. They're, they're not professionals at the beginning. Mm -hmm. They've never been. It's just a guy in a room with a camera, yeah. you know? And they need a bit of help. Beyond tech skills, La Fera also reinforces the mindset that digital culture can bring ideas and connections across cultures in ways that creators themselves might not at first see possible. Albert explains the process behind this. There's also a lack of uh, ambition uh, to get to other audiences, they think if they are doing something in Catalan, it's just for a very few people just from Catalonia. And we say, no, this is not true. The internet makes every language, even Catalan or even smaller ones, a language for everyone. And for example, uh, Korea is a country that has used uh, uh, the digital sphere to, to make a, its culture grow all over the world. We believe in, in, in this as a tool for diversity and, no, and, and make these small uh, and medium languages grow. Mm -hmm. A different language in a different culture is an opportunity, not a liability. So. Cultural rights are the big theme of the Culturopolis conference. La Fera's work is actually related to this, enhancing the possibility for creators to express and disseminate their work. I want to know their opinion on this. What can digital environments do to help in the process of concretely obtaining these rights? One, it's very hard to make you stop. It's very hard to silence you in the digital space. This is good for your rights. And second, as, I, as we said, the barrier of entry is really low. So your, your cultural rights on the internet space are easier to reach, I think. It's a more level playing field and it's an opportunity. But the digital world um, is a very uh, wild place full of uh, companies that uh, monetize uh, the production. So for us it's important also that uh, culture works to protect their creators, but protecting the, in the way of giving them resources and giving them a space to create um, in a m more like human way and not only as numbers for, to monetize in, uh, in YouTube or to, uh, Twitch, no? We use the metaphor of a garden. You have to, to water the, the garden mm, so it, it grows and it grows uh, accordingly to what your main objective is. For La Fera, culture is something essential to the future on how communication and creation functions. They can see that there is sometimes a disconnect at the European level. We don't have any kind of European help. We're not yeah. in this circuit. We are, uh, I don't know, we're not in this sphere. Uh, so we did that by ourselves. And in our plans, there's to look for European funding, maybe in the future, but right now we're not aware. And I think that because when we're looking for ideas, funding, etc. And we saw that um, Europe, when Europe talks about other languages and other communities, it's like folklore for them. Mm. You, see, you see people with regional attire, uh, dancing in a field with flowers on their head. And you think, what? what is this? What is this perception of languages and non-dominant cultures? It's just folklore for you, for us. Our cultures can be in an equal field. Cultures have to be digital. Cultures have to be commercial. There has to be a market for a culture. We take cultures seriously. For us, it's not just dancing and, you know? Yeah. And sometimes we feel that for Europe, other cultures, minority cultures, are just that, just decoration. For us, they're not decoration. We take them seriously. I arrive to El Paralel on the second evening of the conference and immediately find myself in a packed lobby. A large crowd has gathered in the entrance of the theater and is waiting to enter the performance. Once the doors open, we see the stage, lit and covered in large hanging textiles that have been printed with generic images, similar, if not the same, as computer desktop or phone backgrounds. 
On one side of the stage, a ring light is propped up, and familiar sound clips begin to play, and the dancers sashay onto stage. What follows is a mind-blurring performance that hyper-realizes the sounds and movements of creators on the TikTok app for the stage setting. The performance, Cyber Exorcismo, uses the TikTok app as a research base and exercises the mechanisms and choreographic tools from the internet and brings them to the stage. The performance aims to take the images, behaviors, and dances that we experience through the internet and transpose them into a shared theatrical space. Cyber Exorcismo choreographer Nuria Gyu talked a bit more with Marco about her concept and how she takes the digital world directly to live audiences. Specifically for cyber exorcism, I was interested on in how young, and also not so young, but mostly young people, um, is uh, uh, relating to dance nowadays. And I found TikTok, uh, you have a lot of videos in relation to dance. Um, and I was interested to, to work or research on which kind of dances are there, how young people is using this language, these codes, to maybe create community. And I think uh, cyber exorcism, it has many layers that you can uh, unfold while you are watching the performance. So actually there is no statement behind the performance. I, I try to transpose the mechanisms, the corporalities, the dances, the images that are used in the internet. I try to exorcise it, you know, to, to take it out from the flat body of the, our phones, uh, to bring it to a um, ephemeral and a presential physical space like the theater. So for me, it's a way to read it and to create dialogue around this kind of practice. My personal relationship with TikTok started at the beginning of the pandemic. I found myself and to some extent still do, fascinated by the speed with which sound travels on that app. A 30 second clip of a song that was relatively unheard of could overnight end up being the backdrop to millions of videos of people dancing, cooking, performing, seemingly anything. While I was isolated through the pandemic, I felt an undeniable connection to the outside world just through the use of sound. And these sounds are so iconic to the experience of using the app that watching Cyber Exorcismo is not a passive experience. I was actually surprised to find myself singing along with much of the music of the program. Looking over a few seats, I caught eyes with our intern at the time, Emma, who was also singing along. We started laughing, I think in part because of how strange it felt to see live renditions of videos we've only watched alone or in bed from the small glow of our phones. Now, it was a mass shared experience. TikTok, it's a, or like the dances we see in TikTok, they are specifically made to be published, to be recorded and posted on that app. So what we do is to exorcise it from uh, its original body, flat body of the screen, to bring it out and to, to create different ways of seeing it. We are used to see our phones in an individual way. And when you see the same content, but you have like 100 people around you, Maybe you see it differently. I try to work on an archive of TikToks, which I shared with the performers. Um, but for me, it was important also to bring an artistic vision on it. A way uh, to do that for me was, for example, to decontextualize the sound, the original sound. So. Um, Slowly in the performance, what we do is to change the sound of the TikToks for another ongoing atmospheric sounds, which for me reminds also to this kind of mantra or infinite scroll that you go through in the applications. You know, there is something that is there and keeps going. You know, because TikToks are normally like 15 seconds and they appear repeatedly on the screen. And when you remove the sound, you put something else, you start to see this. The infinite scroll that Nuria mentions speaks to me. And even though it was months ago since I saw the performance, I'm struck with a new layer of understanding and interest. 
Nuria frames her work more as a practice of reflecting on images, not necessarily as a commentary on how we consume the digital world. I think it goes in both directions. We are possessed, or I feel we are constantly possessed by images. Uh, everything we see, uh, it, it, it can go in your body and uh, become part of your experience, uh, your identity. So uh, I feel that we can be possessed by internet uh, content, but we can also, or we have the opportunity or possibility of exorcising it. For this performance, uh, cyber exorcism, we are not uh, conceiving the internet like uh, something um, bad or uh, evil. Alongside the conversation around things like copyright and data protection, not only with TikTok, but with other new and ever-changing apps, the digital landscape for artists is rapidly changing. So I want to ask her what does she think about how artists are navigating the current digital terrain? What are the new roads and areas for performative arts that have been opened through the internet? I think um, these appli digital, digital applications, they have potentials for creating new formats of performance, for example. But uh, right now they are very much ruled by certain conditions like for example, as I was saying, like you have specific timings or mm, most of the people knows what will be liked and what won't be liked. So there is a lot of social pressure in that relation of what you can do, what you cannot do. For example, in TikTok, you have specific filters you can use. So it's not whatever, it's just the filters they propose you, of course. So um, and these digital applications, they have a, a very specific design with very specific algorithms, with very specific rules. And um, I think it would be interesting to, to, to dig into these um, rules, who made, who's making these rules, how are they uh, bringing possibilities for performativity or not, or constraining possibilities for performativity. Um, I think there is a lot of people using it in a subvertive way, which is very cool. So there's people creating very cool content. Okay, let's say I'm a, I'm a young artist and I'm trying to, uh, to find my place here. And um, there are not a lot of places where I can find jobs. I mean, there are no dance companies almost in Barcelona right now. So suddenly it's like, okay, I go home maybe. I have the possibility, apparently, in internet, there is this democratization through the digital that you feel that you can establish yourself. So th there is this conflict between, okay, it's a possibility for me to work from the digital, at the same time it's a danger because it's very individualistic you know, to not be supported through the collective uh, community structure. As I contemplate the digital future of the cultural sector, I feel a mixture of excitement and apprehension. On one hand, I'm thrilled at the potential for new technologies and platforms to expand the reach and impact of art and culture, to break down barriers of geography and language and bring us closer together. The prospect of virtual galleries, interactive installations, and global collaborations fills me with a sense of wonder and possibility. But at the same time, I can't help but wonder what this digital future will mean for the traditional forms of art and culture that I cherish. Will physical museums and galleries become obsolete, replaced by digital replicas and immersive experiences? Will the intimacy and authenticity of live performances and face-to-face -face interactions be lost in the rush to embrace digital technologies? And what about the inequities and access barriers that still plague the digital landscape? How will they be addressed in the cultural sector? I have to admit I'm having too much fun with this. That passage was actually the AI again, putting into words what many people are thinking when it comes to the digitalization of the cultural sector. I'm not going to lie, this type of technology is exciting, and I know it's only the beginning of what technology will be able to do. But it's also the beginning of a new frontier of both challenges and innovations for artists and others in the cultural sector. I asked the AI, do you think you and other AI models are a threat to artists? 
and it replies. As an AI language model, I don't see myself or other AI models as a threat to artists. While AI can certainly be used to generate art, music, and other forms of creative content, it is ultimately a tool that can be used in collaboration with human artists to enhance their work. AI can be used to augment and inspire human creativity, providing new ways of thinking about and approaching artistic challenges. Moreover, while AI-generated art and music can be impressive, they lack the emotional depth and personal expression that come from human experience and perspective. Art is ultimately a reflection of the human experience, and no amount of AI can fully replicate the depth and nuance of human emotion and creativity. AI can be a valuable tool for artists, but it's not a replacement for the unique perspective and expression that comes from human artists. This podcast is a collaboration between Michael Culture Association and Culture Action Europe, two network organizations working towards sustainable, diverse, and central spaces for culture. The four-part series is designed and edited by Maya Weisinger from Culture Action Europe and Margot Fiore from MCA. You can find the link for the sources in the description of this episode. For any comment or suggestion about these episodes, please write to Maya, M-A-Y-A, at cultureactioneurope.org. Thank you for listening to our podcast series, and we'll see you sometime in the future.